Tokugawa style. Tokugawa style. I am Sasaki Kojo of the Ganru style. Today, I shall become Japan's number one warrior when I defeat you, Miyamoto Musashi. Tokugawa style. Samurai to 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 Tokugawa style. Bushido to 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 Tokugawa style. Harakiri to 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 Tokugawa style. Harakiri miss. Miss, 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 misconception style. Wait, what? I know what many of you are thinking. Since when do samurai hide in trees, use bow and arrows, and launch sneak attacks? Well, the truth is, the last 20 seconds of that video is actually a more accurate representation of the warriors of Japan than the all-famous samurai image. If your impression of the warrior is a super cool, butt-kicking hero of awesomeness, as opposed to the money-wasting, girl-chasing, tea-drinking, flower-arranging, poetry-writing, theater-going, and rock-watching members of society, then no. Confused yet? Allow us to explain. First off, the Tokugawa period from which the all-famed samurai image, and even the term samurai itself, comes from didn't actually involve much fighting. If anything, they implicated laws to detain the warriors. They outlawed vendettas and jinshi, and you were only allowed to commit harakiri as a means of redeeming yourself after being sentenced for a crime. They also emphasized a fixed social class system, complete with cultural expectations, such as hiding your face when you attended a red light district. This helped keep the warrior class, who were actually working as bureaucrats, not fighting at the time, in power. Some of the cultural norms that were used were left over from the Ashikaga period, which were very zen-based, peace-loving activities that required discipline and a sharp mind. No theater was actually patronized by a third Ashikaga shogun, Yoshimitsu, and tea ceremonies and zen gardens were used for meditation. Not what you first think of when you imagine a samurai, right? But what about... Mushashi. そんなもので。俺を倒せると思っているのか。走ろう。破れたり。何。勝つ身であれば。なぜ鞘を捨てた。そなたに勝てば。この刀なぞもう無用だ。そなたを切った刀を俺は二度と使わぬ。来い。武蔵。well, the idea of an anori, the declaring of one's status and lineage in hopes of finding a worthy enemy, is a very dramatic thing to add into a battle scene. But has anyone ever wondered how impractical it is? You're in battle surrounded by a bunch of other warriors who are also yelling and screaming and everyone's looking for an appropriately matched opponent. That would be like trying to play Marco Polo in a stadium filled with people, where everyone thinks they're Polo. So practically speaking, the Nanari was probably never used in real life, but was invented as an awesome way to include characters in a dramatic retellings of the story. So for now, let's just leave the Nanoris to the professionals. <laughs> Okay, then what about the duels? Well, I guess that makes sense. If you want to gain status, so you may as well know who you're defeating, or who's defeating you. So? So, that would be awesome, if people actually killed like that. The one-on-one -on -one duels were more like tournaments. It was more about the pitting of one school against the other. These martial arts skills were actually born from the Tokugawa in order to give the warrior class something to do. If the warriors are spending their time in these schools, they're spending less time actually fighting. It created another more or less passive, 
past time for the warrior class. It also wouldn't hurt your family status to win one of these one-on-one -on -one battles. Musashi Miyamoto would probably concur. No, I know what you're thinking. Harakiri still happened, right? Yes, but maybe not in the way you would think. Harakiri wasn't popular until the 14th century, when warriors like Kusunogi Masashige was revered for their extreme expression of loyalty through seppuku. There were cases of suicide before that, but they weren't consistent and didn't serve the purpose of highlighting loyalty like later stories, which is odd considering in the Tokugawa period, Jinshi, or the act of killing oneself to follow your master in death, was actually outlawed. You mean Harakiri wasn't a part of the samurai from the beginning of time? Keep in mind that the term samurai actually wasn't used until the Tokugawa period. Throughout time, warriors were synonymous with many terms such as bushi, buke, and suwamono, to name a few. If you're looking at the warriors, though, fighting to the death was standard. Actually, winning at all costs, or to die trying, was what made a good warrior. Meaning that they weren't above ambushing or deception techniques either. Really, though, they used any tools at their disposal, which could vary from swords, to halberds, to daggers, and even vegetables. But what about the Code of Honor? Oh, you mean the Bushido Code? Yeah, that. You mean things like honor, loyalty, courage, valor, bravery, and benevolence? Yeah. You mean being able to look death in the eyes and say, I fear you not? Yeah. Well, that's all invented tradition. What? Yep, that's right. Think about it. In a battle, are you going to give your opponent a fair advantage? You'd want to have the advantage compared to them, right? Bushido actually wasn't a term that solidified until the 18th century, and even then, it wasn't until the 20th century that the ideology really took off. It was introduced to Western audiences even before it became popular in Japan by scholars such as Inazo Nitobe and Daisat Suzuki. Later, it was used in Japan as a unifying term for nation building and indoctrinating the population. But why would they? Well, wouldn't you want to be a samurai? Sure is better than being a noble writing poetry or playing Kamari all day. Or a noble woman with no eyebrows and blackened teeth. Trust us, they knew what they were doing. I feel deceived! What were the samurai? They were loyal, don't get us wrong. The name samurai was actually derived from the earlier term sabadao or sabadafu, which means one who serves in closeness to nobility. In fact, the most popular figures in Japanese history are the most loyal ones. If you trace the warrior history back, way back, then you see that the warriors, even when in power, were pretty much consistently serving someone. Whoa, so samurai weren't really super cool, butt-kicking hero of awesomeness? Not samurai per se, but the Japanese did have some really cool butt-kicking warriors. We just have to look back a little further. After all, the samurai image was based on something, right? Just maybe not in the way you'd think. Remember the end of that video? As opposed to the all-famous sword, the bow and arrow is actually the preferred weapon of the early warrior. Most of the earliest warrior accounts highlighted skilled archers such as Raiko. This was probably a response to the attacks from the north by the barbarians on horseback. Wait, horses? There are horses now? Well, yes, for the first warriors, and then the later warriors of status. That would explain the preference of the bow and arrow. After all, it is the most rational weapon on horseback. I mean, have you ever tried to cut somebody with a sword on horseback? It's kind of hard. And awkward. Plus, you leave yourself open to attacks. It's no surprise the warriors of status would have continued using bow and arrows from horseback. You've got to distinguish yourself from the measly foot soldier somehow. Just like how the horses had become a sign of status, the sword also went through the same process. By the Tokugawa period, it had become a symbol of status and prestige, denoting the samurai class. Now, if you go back to the archer in the video... Whoa. You may not have seen that coming, but our warrior did. That's amazing! In Japanese culture, as a warrior, it was your responsibility to be prepared. If you were caught off guard, that was your own fault. It wasn't considered dirty or cowardly to attack from behind, but in fact demonstrated cunning and strength. This also kind of ties into the nanari. After all, isn't it sort of dumb to announce yourself if you're trying to be sneaky? Anyways, the point we're trying to make is that the samurai probably weren't what you thought they were. All of these images linked to the samurai were true at some point in time, but they don't construct the complete and cohesive image that we see in popular culture today, but rather as a compilation of values seen as admirable in the warrior class throughout the many years of Japanese history. We hope this video cleared up some of your misconceptions on the samurai, and if you found some things interesting, make sure to check out all of our sources below. They're actually pretty interesting. So remember to always watch your back and take history with a grain of salt, because by the time it reaches us, it is more than possible to have been altered over time due to the various interpretations. Now that you know all these things, next time you see something cool, ask yourself, does this make sense?
This is all for you, Shogun. It's really cold. <laughs> no, you don't understand how cold it is. No, it's really cold and it started snowing.